dispersion relation and index ellipsoids. So we'll discuss the dispersion relation, and that of course takes us into dispersion surfaces and everything we'll learn from those, and index ellipsoids, which are almost the same thing as dispersion surfaces. Dispersion relation. So intimate through all out this is the concept of the wave vector that you're probably already familiar with. So the wave vector is a vector and it is conveying two pieces of information at the same time, like all vectors do. The magnitude of the wave vector most fundamentally conveys wavelength. So the magnitude of K is two pi divided by the wavelength. Now, if the frequency of the wave is known, then the wavelength in free space is also known and fixed. So when that is the case, the magnitude of our wave vector, we can write as two pi over this free space wavelength times the refractive index. So when this is known, when the frequency is known, the magnitude of the wave vector actually conveys refractive index. If frequency is not known, then it only conveys wavelength. The second piece of information is that it points in the direction the wave is propagating. And that's what's being shown in this, this there's a little animation over here on the right. You can see the, the red and the blue. Those are the wave fronts. They're moving along. And no matter what direction that wave is propagating, that wave vector is always perpendicular to those phase fronts. So that's our wave vector. The dispersion relation. OK, so back when you were studying electromagnetics for the first time, you were studying Maxwell's equations. At some point, you took the curl equations. You combined them to get the wave equation. You solve the wave equation and got a plane wave, and it had a polarization, it had an oscillation term. If you take the expression for a plane wave and plug that back into the wave equation and then do some algebra with that, out comes the dispersion relation. And you're seeing the dispersion relation here for linear homogeneous isotropic materials. And fundamentally, dispersion relations define something like it relates the wave vector to the frequency of the wave. And uh, let me redefine that in, in a way that maybe makes a little bit more sense. It's really a rule that the wave vector has to follow depending on its direction. We can't choose any value of K in any direction at the same time. It has to follow a rule. And that rule is set by the dispersion relation. Another way we can write the same dispersion relation, we can recognize that omega over C naught is K naught. That's our free space wave number. And we can take this in, we can bring it over to the left-hand side. So we have our Ka squared plus Kb squared plus Kc squared now divided by n squared. And then we are left with K naught squared over here. We can also bring that to the left and we write that here. So just an alternate form and we'll be writing some other dispersion relations using a similar form to that. So I want you to get used to seeing that. So how do we derive this dispersion relation? Well. The first thing, we, we need the wave equation. And since we're talking about anisotropic materials, I'm gonna let the permittivity stay anisotropic. We're ignoring the magnetic response right now. So the permittivity is anisotropic. Well, we solve that and we get plane waves. And these plane waves have some polarization and they have an oscillation term. We then plug this expression for the waves back into our wave equation and we end up here and we can separate the vector components and we get you know a big ugly expression in the a direction a big ugly expression in the b direction and another big ugly expression in the c direction we add all that together and we get equal to zero so each of these terms these big ugly expressions has this following form it's a smaller but still somewhat big ugly expression times E in the A direction plus another expression times E in the B direction plus another expression times E in the C direction. And uh, each of these up here individually have to equal zero. So we'll get three of these equations each equaling zero. So we'll have one for the A component, one for the B component, one for the C component, which we can then write in matrix form. And yes, there is a lot of algebra here. Once we have that matrix form, we 
calculate its determinant, set that equal to zero, and solutions that make that zero are our solution for K. We can also recognize that as the eigenvalues of the matrix. When we do that for general anisotropic media, we end up here. And this is what we're going to analyze several different ways. And something else I'll just mention that's sort of interesting, but given a wave vector, we can also calculate the polarization. And by the way, that information would come from the eigenvectors of this matrix. So for general anisotropic media, we have our three principal values, and we call this the diagonalized form of our tensor. So we're clearly analyzing in its natural coordinate system. And if we solve it, we get a dispersion relation that looks something like this. And we could do some algebra on that, put it in a different form that's more useful. As we'll see, we can derive other dispersion relations from it for special cases from this general case. Let's look at our first special case. And so the dispersion relation for uniaxial crystals, remember what a uniaxial crystal is. Uh, we have two values along the tensor that are the same. We call those the ordinary values, and then the third one is the extraordinary value. And here we're looking at this in terms of refractive index. So our dispersion relation now looks like this. It is really the product of two things. And if we stare at this long enough, we'll actually recognize that's an equation for a sphere. And this is an equation for an ellipse, and we're starting to get into what dispersion surfaces are. And each one of those corresponds to a different polarization, right? Because in a homogeneous medium, we always have two possible polarizations. Well, one, its wave vector will follow this rule, and the other, its wave vector will follow this rule. So we'll call that the extraordinary wave, and then we have the ordinary wave. So we hinted about these things called dispersion surfaces. Let's get into that. So let's start with simple linear homogeneous isotropic materials, and we're writing the dispersion relation for that. And if we stare at this long enough, we realize this actually is the equation for a sphere, where the radius is k naught times n. And we can draw a sphere, and so we will call that a dispersion surface. And we can think of this really as a map of what magnitude our wave vector can take on as a function of direction. So in LHI materials, no matter what direction the wave goes, it really sees the same refractive index. It has the same wavelength. So this dispersion surface is a perfect sphere. These dispersion surfaces also come in different names, dispersion surfaces, K surfaces, momentum space, uh, and probably some names uh, I'm not even thinking of, but I'll call them dispersion surfaces. So we have a sphere, no matter what direction a wave tries to go, it sees the same refractive index, has the same wavelength, so we're mapping out a sphere here. It's constant in all directions. Let's look at the dispersion surfaces for uniaxial crystals. And after some algebra, we can write the dispersion relation this way. And what we see is the product of two expressions. One expression we will call an ordinary wave and the other expression we will call the extraordinary wave. So uniaxial crystals support two different waves and each will have its own polarization. So let's focus on the first one. And if we stare at that long enough, what we see is that's an equation for a sphere, which is why we call this an ordinary wave. So no matter what direction this wave tries to go, it sees the same refractive index. Well, this is exactly what we talked about for uh, ordinary isotropic materials. And in this case, it's the extraordinary refractive index that this wave sees in all possible directions. A bit more interesting is the extraordinary wave. We could tell that's not the equation for a sphere. So if we look at that, what we see is that is an equation for an ellipsoid. And in fact, we can draw two different types of ellipsoids depending whether it's the ordinary refractive index or the extraordinary refractive index that is larger or smaller. The most typical case is when the extraordinary axis has the higher refractive index. In this case, the index ellipsoid is sort of egg or cucumber shaped, 
with the longer axis going along the extraordinary axis direction. And then around the perimeter of the other of this index ellipsoid and the other two directions, uh, A and B, what we see is the ordinary refractive index. Now, this is the other way around. This is called negative birefringence, the previous case positive birefringence. So now we have the extraordinary refractive index less than the ordinary. Now our dispersion surface, our index ellipsoid, it's shaped like a pill. And the smaller axis, the extraordinary axis, and then around the perimeter, around the side, is all the extraordinary refractive index, so in the A and B directions. Some notes about these dispersion surfaces. Notice both the ordinary wave and extraordinary wave, they share a single axis. In this case, it's the C axis. So the dispersion surfaces touch at the top and the bottom. So waves traveling in the C direction will always see the extraordinary refractive index regardless of which dispersion surface it's associated with. Since this is a single axis, that's why these are called uniaxial crystals. So sometimes that axis is called the optic axis, the ordinary axis, the C axis, the uniaxial axis, has many names, but we're referring to this one axis where the two index ellipsoids touch. Now, if a wave deviates from that, we will always have the ordinary wave that sees the extraordinary refractive index. But in this case, at some off angle, we will have two possible waves seeing two possible polarizations. And we see phenomenon like a wave going into one of these crystals and then splitting if you can excite both of those polarizations. Interesting stuff, that's called double refraction. So the dispersion surfaces for biaxial crystals are, are quite crazy. I'm not attempting to draw them too much here. What I have drawn is cross sections of those index ellipsoids in the plane. So XY plane, XZ plane, YZ plane. And that's what you're seeing here. What we should mention is notice that the dispersion surfaces are touching at four different points. So there's one point, two points, three points, four points and I can connect them in pairs by lines. And so along these lines, since the dispersion surfaces are touching, um, the wave behaves as ordinary and both waves here behave the same and see the same refractive index. So these are called the optic axes. And since there's two optic axes, these types of crystals are called biaxial crystals. We can try to understand this a little bit better by looking at some special cases, which we sort of illustrated on the previous slide. But if we set Ka equal to zero, so we just want to look at these index ellipsoids in the YZ plane, or I should say the, the KB, KC plane, we would see something like this. And we see certainly two index ellipsoids. And so we can think of these as a cross section of the full index ellipsoids. Likewise, we can set KB equal to zero and look at those two index ellipsoids. Now we actually see where the two cross, these happen to be the four points where the two dispersion surfaces sort of pinch together. And we can define our two optic axes here that we're drawing with the sort of the gold dashed lines here and then setting and last we can set kc equal to zero so we're looking at the cross section of our index ellipsoids in the ka kb plane and we still see our two dispersion surfaces and then all together this is the the animation that we saw to begin with and as i mentioned drawing three-dimensional dispersion surfaces for biaxial i'm not even really attempting here As an aside, um, there are magnetoelectric materials that have a modified dispersion relation. And these have really crazy dispersion surfaces. So I have a reference at the bottom that's very good. And I'd invite you to go, go look at that and do some more reading. And later on in this course, you'll discover that you can really engineer the behavior of materials through their dispersion surfaces. And if we have more freedom to engineer the shapes of these, we can do more cool things. Uh, I'm not going to get into that here. I'm saving that for later lectures. Index ellipsoids. So 
back to drawing these surfaces. And remember I said, eh, if you stare at this long enough, it looks like the equation for a sphere. So let's actually write it that way. And let's just make the radius of the sphere refractive index. So now this really is a map of refractive index as a function of direction. In my mind, the dispersion surfaces and the index ellipsoids, they really are the same thing. They're mapping out the same surface. Uh, they're scaled simply by a K naught term. And so you will hear me use these interchangeably, dispersion surface or index ellipsoid, but technically speaking, they're slightly different things. And index ellipsoid really is mapping out refractive index as a function of direction of the wave. So for LHI material, linear homogeneous isotropic, that index ellipsoid is a perfect circle because no matter what direction the wave tries to go, it sees the same refractive index in all directions. It's kind of boring. Here's a neat way I've come up with to visualize these index ellipsoids and really what they're telling us. And while we're looking, this gray circle here is the index ellipsoid for an LHI material. And we can see this blue arrow here. That's the direction of a wave in this material. And of course, this, this red little wiggly thing here, that is the wave. And what we notice is no matter what direction the wave is going, um, that's always has the same period. It's always traveling at the same speed, really no matter what direction it's traveling through this particular material. Now it gets a little bit more interesting if we look at a uniaxial medium. This is positive uniaxial because the extraordinary axis is larger than the two ordinary axes. And now when we look at the wave, what we can see when it's near vertical, it's traveling more slowly and also much more compressed. So the wavelength is compressed. However, when it's propagating in the AB plane, it's propagating faster because the refractive index is lower and the wavelength is stretched out. So actually, as the wave changes direction, the speed and wavelength are changing as it's changing direction. And I think that's quite interesting, much more interesting than the isotropic case. Let's look at the negative uniaxial media where the extraordinary axis is actually smaller than the ordinary axes. All the same conclusions other than now when the wave is in the AB plane, this is when it's traveling most slowly and the wave is most compressed. Whereas vertically, when the refractive index is the smallest, that's when the wave is traveling faster and is the most spread out. So this really is what these index ellipsoids is telling us. However, when you see them on paper, of course we can't animate them with, with fancy waves and all that, but that really is what they're telling us. And it's very interesting that materials can exhibit a different refractive index for waves traveling in different directions. And the applications of that, I'm really saving for other lectures, but I'll, I'll touch on a little bit here. So let's, talk very briefly about the direction that power flows in these things. Now here, I'm just looking at a cross section of a sphere. So we're looking at a circle. And if I pick a point on that surface and I create a vector that extends from the origin to that point on the surface that I've picked, that's my wave vector. That's the direction that the ripples of my wave is progressing. Now power, it turns out is just defined differently. And it travels in a direction that is perpendicular to the tangent at the same point that we've picked. Now, since this is a circle, the power or my pointing vector is in parallel or in the same direction as K. So the power in my wave travels in the same direction the ripples are going. And since this is the simple LHI case, this is what we learn in electromagnetics. This is how our brains get programmed. So when anything else happens, it seems magical, but I would actually call this the more special case. So let's look at what happens in an anisotropic medium when it, this is an ellipse instead of a circle. So we have an ellipse and I'll progress through the same progression of things. I'm gonna pick a point on the surface and the vector that connects the origin to that point on the surface that is the progression of phase. So the ripples will be traveling in this direction. But the direction that the power is going is just defined differently. It is perpendicular to the tangent. So now power and phase are in different directions. And I have an illustration of that later to give you an idea of what that actually looks like. But this is reasonably common. 
but it seems magical because we're not really ever taught that. So here is that visualization. So we have a wave and this in the, an ordinary medium where your ripples and your power are traveling in the same direction. Everything is as we've we've learned. But now we're going into the second magical medium that has power and phase in different directions. So we can see that phase, our ripples are actually moving in this direction. But if we were to squint our eyes, our eyes don't see phase, and just look at the, the shape of the beam, well, power is actually moving in this direction. And that seems weird. And here's an analogy of, of something you could do at home to sort of understand how this is happening. So uh, stand still and then spin around 20 times real fast. Get yourself very dizzy. Now pick an object some distance away and walk toward it. So your body's facing that object, your face is facing that object, that sort of phase, that's the direction you want to go. Your body's facing that, you're trying to walk in that direction, but you know what, you're dizzy and you're actually drifting off in a completely different direction. And waves inside anisotropic materials and also some other crazy inhomogeneous materials also do this. And the, the power is moving in one direction, phase is moving in another, and, and other really weird, cool things happen. It's a fascinating subject. Here is another neat phenomenon that can happen in anisotropic materials that you're in a great position to understand, and it is called double refraction. But first, let's just look at ordinary isotropic materials. And here I'm illustrating what's called phase matching, and it's a generalization to Snell's law to predict refraction in uh, situations that are a bit more complex than just two simple materials on either side of an interface. But what I've done in medium one, I've drawn half of the index ellipsoid. And in medium two, I've drawn half of its index ellipsoid. So clearly down here, the index ellipsoid is larger. So there's a larger refractive index down here. And we have a smaller refractive index up here. So we have an incoming wave vector. And that always has to be a vector that extends you know, from the origin to a point on the surface. But because the direction of the wave is incoming, we, we actually go from the point to the origin. Now, phase matching requires that the tangential component of the wave vector is continuous across the interface. And so what I'll do is I'll drop a little projection down. And this is the tangential component, this green arrow. For convenience, I'll copy that over here. That's the tangential component of the wave, which has to be continuous down here. So I will drop a projection down until it hits the surface. And this is the wave vector in the second medium. And we can see that there's a bend here. And we understand that that is refraction for the ordinary case. Nothing magical there. But what happens now in an anisotropic material that remember has two different index ellipsoids? Well, uh, same incoming wave vector, we drop the projection down, we get this tangential component, we copy it over here for convenience, and we drop a projection down, we actually cross two different dispersion surfaces or index ellipsoids. This means there's the potential for two different waves. So our wave can actually split and then travel in different directions. And this is a physical thing. Uh, here is a double refracting crystal that I've laid over top of my research lab's logo. And you, if you look closely, you can see how it is split. The image has gone double. And that's not because there's a rough surface or anything like that. That is double refraction happening. And this is called optical quartz. And a lot of times at, at gem shows or, or gem shops, you can buy this optical quartz. There's also other kind of cool rocks that have other weird optical effects. Uh, TV rock, look at that, that's pretty cool. So that's it for anisotropy.